Good afternoon. My name is Mike Sasko. I'm the Vice President of Government Solutions at Softion, and thanks for joining our afternoon session. Today, we'll address the impact of state Medicaid reassessments. As state Medicaid populations have greatly expanded during 2020 and the pandemic, they continue to expand today. But as we slowly move toward the end of the public health emergency, states are putting together plans and strategies to execute in the future next phase. For our speakers today, we have Craig Kennedy, the CEO of Medicaid Health Plans of America. He'll provide an overview of where we stand in our Medicaid populations, as well as the current administration's role in, in Medicaid expansion. Next, uh, from a state perspective, Nana Spinner, the Director of Eligibility Office of Medicaid Policy and Planning in Indiana and the Indiana Family and Social Services Administration will provide her perspective and she'll speak to the clog that she anticipates having uh, in the coming months. Our third speaker will be Josh Schultz. Josh is a senior policy analyst and he'll, he'll speak first of all to the history of Medicaid redeterminations and then probably more importantly, what's currently going on in our states as legislation is flowing uh, in this direction. And then finally, uh, I'll, do, I'll wrap us up and uh, move us into question and answer. So with that, I'm gonna hand off to our first speaker, Craig, uh, please, please begin. Thanks, Mike. And as I come up, I'll just notice that nothing has changed these days. I'll put on my mask and we'll, uh, we'll be ready for our presentation. We sit. Now the whole group is just freaking out. They're like, Craig is gonna keep that mask on the whole time. No. Nothing has changed here, though, in this uh, in this city or in Washington D.C. My name is Craig Kennedy. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, I'm, as Mike pointed out, I'm the president and CEO of the Medicaid Health Plans of America. First slide. Thank you, Josh. Um, the Medicaid Health. Let me start with myself. I've come here for. I've been here about a year and a half. And before that, I was the executive director of the Clinicians for the Underserved. And before that, I did policy work for the National Association of Community Health Centers. And so really come from an underserved background, come from a, a helping folks within the healthcare space with underserved access to care. And before that, I worked on Capitol Hill, both on the House and Senate side, and then at the state legislature as well, years ago, uh, too many years ago. As you'll notice, the, probably my picture is a little less gray than my, uh, my actual profile here. I'm very interested in this conversation. And again, Josh, Mike, uh, Nonis, I'd like to make sure that this is just a conversation, right? And that we have this, we have a lot of questions from folks as we go through. Hope we get a lot of feedback and, and engagement strategies. MHPA is the association for the managed care companies that work in the Medicaid space. So the folks that we represent, represent about um, 38 million. They, they serve about 38 million covered lives in the country today. Um, about a little over 120 separate plans across the country. A lot of the names that you know, um, the Centines, the Aetnas, the Molinas, the Gateways, the and some so nationwide plans, also state-specific plans, Arkansas Blue Cross Blue Shield, things like that, and also sub-state plans and population-based plans. Anybody that really takes um, assumes risk within the Medicaid space can be a member of Medicaid Health Plans of America. And like I said, we're, we're at about 38 million covered lives for our members today. And if you figure there's about 75 million, roughly 75 million people covered by Medicaid today, we're just about, just about half, a little bit over half of that entire population um, is covered by members of MHPA. So a pretty good sized footprint for the association. So very involved in a lot of the discussions around Medicaid specific activities. And as I started out with my, my mask joke, uh, nothing's changed in this last year, so my presentation will be very short. It, you can't hear the feedback anymore on these things, right? The Zoom calls, you can't consider an audience. And, and obviously that was a joke, folks. So I realize this is recorded. My joke is gonna fall as flat during the recording as it did right then, but I'll keep going. Um, so <laughs> Medicaid Health Plans of America, we've been very engaged within the, um, this public health pandemic right, this public health emergency, this global pandemic. All the way back, we started with conversations, sending letters to CMS about flexibility right at the beginning back last March, trying to figure out what, what from a Medicaid health plan perspective was necessary to ensure access to care for the populations we serve. 
And it's, and I just want to be real clear throughout this entire presentation, there isn't one population that is Medicaid. That's just not a thing, right? There's not one population. There's a whole bunch of different folks that are within the Medicaid program. Um, and so it's, it's a diversity of opinions and, and tactics and strategies to, to, to serve the populations that we do. And so, um, Going back, we saw that there was going to be real problems right at the beginning of COVID um, accessing populations in nursing homes. Elderly was obviously the first point of point of interest there. How would you deliver those services? How were the workforce trained? How would you get alternative uh, functions that we do as well, like meals, transportation services, things that, that health plans also engage in within the spaces that were really being impacted very early in the COVID space and then everybody across the country as we went on, as we saw. And so we weighed in last March um, saying, raising a flag real quick. And I realized March, you guys will say, actually it was January, February, but last March, March 11th, we sent a letter to CMS asking for a number of flexibilities um, and seeking flexibilities. Telehealth is the one that you'll always hear, right? Everybody talks about telehealth these days, but there's a ton of other things that needed to occur within this space. We're gonna go through some of them today and then we're going to work our way back into, into what the next steps are here in a bit. So we looked for a lot of flexibility right up front. And as noted here, the Families First Coronavirus Act, um, what it did was it also said, we understand it's going to impact states in a massive way, which are partners within the Medicaid space, which everybody here already knows. But, um, but what they did was they bumped up the, the FMAP 6.2%. In exchange, they said, you know what, for a while, while we're in this emergency, don't disenroll anybody, right? And we'll, to, we'll refer to that as the maintenance of effort clause. So they enacted this MOE that said, don't disenroll anybody, but here's your 6.2% to make up for, your, for the problems within the states. To be honest with you, MHPA thought that was, um, we, I'll say it this way. We agreed with many others that that was an insufficient number, 6.2%, that it should have been closer to 12 or 14% within the FMAP bump to really make states whole, to really make them based on the economic impacts, based on the Medicaid impacts, based on the, 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 the impacts of the pandemic. And so we pushed with, NG, with the National Governor Association, the National Association of Medicaid Directors, a lot of different folks to say that FMAC needs to be bumped up even further. Congress did never come to do that. Um, however, that 6.2% remains and the MOE remains as, every, as the point of this conversation we'll get to shortly for a number of reasons. And if you want to switch to the next, I think it's the next slide, uh, two slides. So, uh, okay, maybe three slides. The first two, the first uh, chart, when the chart comes up. Um, what happened was we started seeing Medicaid enrollment rise every month, right? So you started seeing changes, 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 increases across the country in Medicaid enrollment. Um, this is just a snapshot, right? This is May through November, if I'm seeing my screen correctly. Um, yeah, May through November, right? Then you can see increases, increases, increases. This is, this is due to a number of things, right? If you go to the next slide, every state saw this. This isn't just a nationwide trend. Every single state saw enrollment increase in Medicaid throughout the pandemic. Every single state, right? So all of them, right? Uh, so national averages right there in the middle, so you saw this, this growth. And if you go to the next slide, this is the, this is the most obvious reason why um, people were unemployed, right? People lost their jobs. People lost their jobs and were thrown out of work. And we all know this. But what happened was, it, it, and this slide I think is interesting from my perspective. This is from um, the Congressional Research Service. <laughs> the other ones were Kaiser Family Foundation. I'll credit those so I don't get in trouble later. But um, the Congressional Research Service, you can see what happened was part-time workers spiked really high and then went down. And those are the folks, to be honest with you, within the Medicaid space, we see a lot of part-time workers, right? That's a lot of folks in the Medicaid space have income, but are low-income workers, right? These are folks that, that do one or two jobs that don't offer health insurance and have low wages and qualify for their Medicaid program, right? So, so this part-time worker space and sometimes full-time worker space um, is full of Medicaid, Medicaid beneficiaries. So you look at this and you'll see those part-time workers, when they lose their job, they're really in real trouble within the health insurance industry, right? Their health insurance space, they need something. They've either lost 
a plan that they might have had or really had a real spike and been thrown into Medicaid right away and eligibility. So, so we saw a spike in eligibility, folks that really saw um, lost their lost their jobs. Now, Congress had a couple of different actions to try to try to help with that. The loans, COBRA extension, a lot of different alternatives. But I believe the data here will show um, that 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 unemployment data is going to drive Medicaid enrollment. What also is going to drive Medicaid enrollment is that you're not disenrolling anybody, right? And if you scroll on back to a couple of slides back, sorry, back to the words again, sorry. There you go, uh, one more, there you go. Uh, yeah, so uh, well, we can go forward one more. So this was the general slide where you saw, uh, um, so then we had the MOE and a lot of folks were saying, you're not disenrolling people. And a lot, as you heard a lot of folks across the country say, we're seeing increases because we're not disenrolling people. And, and in some, some measure, I'll be honest with you, I had people complain about that. And, and I was like, I get it. I understand that that's an, that's an operational function all the time, but we're in a pandemic. And the last thing you wanna do is have people lose their insurance, right? So that was the intent of Congress was to say, let's just, let's just, put, let's just pause this. We bumped up the FMAP, let's pause it for a bit. Um, keep folks enrolled in their health insurance that they have today. Um, and we'll figure it out as we go along. Nobody really expected it to be this long in the beginning when we started that, but really had this discussion about um, keeping people insured during a pandemic, right? That was an easy argument to make, keep people insured. So now, so now we're looking at the American Rescue. This is American Rescue Plan, let's be honest, is what COVID number four is COVID package number three, four, five, depending on how you count these as we go forward which is a long way into this, right? We're a long way into Congress's engagement within this activity. And so what they looked at was a couple different things was, uh, are we going to increase FMAP globally? Like MHPA had asked and others. Um, what are we gonna do for folks that haven't expanded Medicaid? What states that haven't expanded Medicaid and how we can kind of push them towards that? Um, but there was, there was just some, and there was the Rescue Act had trillion dollars in other spending, and I'm not joking, a trillion dollars in other spending. But it, it they ended up not expanding the general FMAP. They did it in a targeted way for different populations and different folks, uh, different types of activities within Medicaid. Um, one that we supported was uh, coverage of incarcerated individuals for continuity process, but that got dropped in the end. Um, HCP, HCBS and some other populations did get these bumps in there, um, but there wasn't a broad brush FMAP increase. So it's still stayed at 6.2. You still have this maintenance of effort that is kind of running through the, the entire operation now. And as you saw in that last chart, unemployment is starting to come back down, right? Unemployment is coming back down. People are getting their jobs had through the uh, Paycheck Protection Act, um, had a couple of them had their jobs, kept some of their insurances. COBRA was in, included in this last package as well. So a lot of folks that had insurances were able to keep it. So now, is that the last COVID package? I don't know, probably, is my, my bet in that regard. So now we all start looking at, well, not start, but we have been looking at what happens at the end of this? What happens as we take our masks off, as we go back to normal operations? What happens within the Medicaid space, right? What happens to that 6.2% bump? What happens to the maintenance of effort? What happens to all of the waivers, right? All of the waivers that states have applied for, which we loved, that was, Back to our March letter last year, March of last year, um, that flexibility was critical. Every single state has a has filed at least a waiver, multiple waivers within their program to adjust to the to the COVID and uh, pandemic. And so you have 1135 waivers, you have 1115 waivers, you have spas, you have 1915K waivers. You have a whole series of waivers that people have engaged in. Um, across the country in every single state, every single state has some sort of waiver strategy. And some of these are terrific. Let me be honest with you. Some of these, we, we strongly support permanent extension of, right? We want to see this, this kind of kick the ball forward on some of these things, but others, others, it really is an emergency activity. And, and I, <laughs> for this presentation, I just printed them all out at one point. I was like, holy smoke, CMS has their work cut out for them, right? I mean, let's be honest. They have their work cut out for them to just go back through, figure out if this is something, to be honest with you, they don't have a lot of flexibility. 
on 1135s. 1135s, the statute says, ends right at the end of a public health emergency. Even on these 1115s and the spas that folks have gone through, some of those are going to end their emergency authorities that allowed them to do that. So some of these are going to end too. So we've got to figure out how do we keep some of the good within this space? How do we keep some of the things that were novel and thoughtful and that states thought, hey, you know what? We can do that going forward to the benefit of everybody and, and keeping them engaged within their healthcare infrastructure. This healthcare infrastructure um, is always the intent, right? And so CMS is uh, uh, last December, right? As uh, Nanas will tell you, uh, put out a letter. Of very, I forgot how many pages. 45, 65, 75. I can't remember how many pages this letter was. They went, they, they started to go through line by line. What would happen after this pandemic ends? Um, what do we need to start thinking about within 1135s, within 1115s, within, within spas, within 1915Ks? How long do we have? What does the statute tell us that we can maybe embed? And how do we do that? And where do we go from there? So there's been some thought already given to it, but I don't know if you know this, but there was an election and the people that wrote that in December may not be the same people that are there today. <laughs> um, and so there may be some discussion going forward in that, but that, that was a fairly thorough document, let's be honest. And I think they're going to have to look at that and say, how do we go back through, look at that and say, um, end of the public health emergency, what does it look like exactly? And top of the fold for a lot of folks, especially at the state level, are those waivers and the end of the MOE. And I'll tell you, Congress is looking at that MOE and saying, we did it, but the, I'm putting words in a whole bunch of people's mouths. So don't quote me that I'm quoting one particular person, but um, the MOE was in, chain, was in exchange for the FMAP bump. A lot of folks see it one for one. We're not doing the FMAP bump, we get rid of the MOE. And the, and the FMAP bump ends at the end of the PHE. Sorry for all the acronyms. I'll send around a chart later. But the PHE, the public health emergency, when that ends, do you have 30 days? Do you have 60 days? Does it end on that day? When does the FMAP bump end? Looks like PHE is through the end of the year. That's the, the word on the street these days, right? That everybody's seen. Does it go beyond that? We don't know what the fall looks like. Does that mean states have to budget for 60 days, 30 days, 90 days? What at the end of that? And what does the MOE look like? But so we know it's coming. We know it's coming. We know the FMAP is coming. <laughs> Unfortunately, we know these things are going to change going forward with no, with no other statements except the end of the public health emergency. All these things are triggered. And so then what happens? Um, we're in the letter writing business for the Medicaid Health Plans of America. We sent a bunch of letters on this. We sent a, a recent one, a whole table of, of, of things that we need to be considered um, on what kind of flexibilities need to occur. Um, what kind of, where does telehealth continue to stand? Where does using out of network providers or out of state providers stand? Um, how do you report all this data, especially within quality reporting methodologies, right, that have different payment rates. What about the payment rates themselves? All these things are up for discussion as we speak. But we know there's massive change coming because we're optimistic the PHE will end. We'll get back to normal. I'll get to take off my mask. I'll actually be able to see you in person. And, uh, and not wear a mask. I, I, I will not wear a mask. I am fully vaccinated, just to let you know. I, I know we're on camera, but I'm fully vaccinated, so I could take off my mask. That's why we did that. Um, but then we get into the redeterminations. And again, the MOE applied across the board. You have all of these waivers already in place that, that, are, that are a complicating factor as well, right? So you have all this activity within the states. States are going to be... Um, um, I overwhelmed is not the right word, <laughs> uh, challenged to keep up with all of the moving pieces. I'm glad a lot of people are giving it thought today already at the federal and state level. Um, but those redeterminations are going to be a huge driver of how many people actually have Medicaid after this PHE ends, right? How many people are on Medicaid? We're at about 75, 77, depends on which month you pick and what data you can find. Somewhere between 75 and 77, that's up, that's up millions of people. Do all of them lose Medicaid coverage? Um, from MHPA's perspective, um, A, we wanna to return to normalcy, right? That's for sure. We wanna be able to come back. We wanna take the good parts of 
this emergency that pushed healthcare ac access forward. Um, but we also don't want people dropped from Medicaid that don't have another source of insurance, right? So, and I know uh, this might be part of Soft Dion's later, but uh, <laughs> um, a seamless transition. If you're not on Medicaid, do you qualify in the exchanges? Can you get in the marketplace and get the subsidy and make sure that those folks make it into those different places? Don't, let's not look at it just from a Medicaid perspective, look at it from an underserved perspective. And that's where, that's why I started with my background on um, coming from community health centers and coming from clinicians for the underserved. Let's make sure these folks have insurance. Let's go through these processes. Let's make sure they have coverage and they have access to care within this country during and after this public health emergency. So I'll turn it over to the folks that actually know the details of how this all works. Um, sorry for going a little bit long there, Nanas, but um, um, really wanted to make a point of, there's a lot of moving pieces. You think it's just public health emergency, end of the public health emergency redeterminations. There's a, there's a thousand moving pieces and, uh, and, and millions and millions of lives um, involved. So thank you for giving me the time and I'll, I'm looking forward to questions. Thank you so much, Craig. Uh, hi, my name is Nana Spinner. I'm the Medicaid Eligibility Director in the state of Indiana. I started out as a caseworker um, in 2010, and then in 2014, I was hired by our eligibility and enrollment system as a business systems consultant. I was the lead BSC for implementation of HIP 2.0, which was you know, a, a very big thing in Indiana. Um, and I, in 2015, moved on to be the Medicaid eligibility director. So I still have a, a soft spot in my heart for all of the technical work that has to be done to support the policies that we come up with to really assist individuals in attaining and maintaining their coverage um, when they're eligible for this program. Uh, and I think the slide needs to be advanced to number seven. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of just an overview and uh, we can go ahead to the next slide. Thank you. So we talked about maintenance of effort, uh, the MOE for the PHE, for the FFCRA, uh, as Craig was talking about. Um, so what we have seen in Indiana, and I don't think that is unique to our state, is that this has effectively gotten rid of what we call churn, which is um, mostly people who don't have big changes in their income, but maybe they stop working at Wendy's and they go to work at McDonald's and they don't turn in a pay stub and so they get closed. So those types of things have been eliminated now. Um, we have seen that our enrollment is up 27%, but our applications are actually down 36% because those individuals who keep getting disenrolled, they reapply, disenrolled, reapply, that cycle has stopped. Um, so that has been really eye-opening for us to see, you know, we expected that we would just be inundated with applications and that has not happened. Um, next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about our redeterminations. And I think there are so many, you know, we've got reassessment, redetermination, renewal. I think CMS sometimes calls them redes. Um, but it's all talking about the annual process where you need to, you um, be determined again to be eligible for the next year's coverage. So we call our process kind of splitting them into buckets. The first bucket are those who are true ex parte renewal. We know everything we need to know about you. The information is current, it's reliable. We're going to send you a letter that says, congratulations, you've been renewed for another year. This is the information that we use to make that determination. Let us know if anything has changed. Then we have our second bucket, which are individuals that we have all of the information that we need on you, but maybe it hasn't been updated in a while. We haven't gotten any electronic verifications on you. or it, So we have the information we need, but we wanna make sure it's correct. So we send a mailer out to them that says, here's everything we know about you. If anything has changed, note what has changed and send it back to us with your signature. Um, if they don't have any changes to report, then they are also auto-renewed. And then we have a third bucket, which is what we call our must return mailers. So these are individuals that have something questionable. Maybe it's not reasonably compatible. We got new information from an electronic source. Uh, something there needs to be verified. And so those are the individuals that if they don't comply with what we ask them to provide as part of this redetermination process, their Medicaid could be closed. Um, so during the public health emergency, we have been continuing the first and second buckets, um, but that third one we have been postponing 
uh, because we knew that we couldn't disenroll you. So we decided, well, and this was closer to the start, decided, well, you know, we've got to uh, measure our bandwidth, see what we can prioritize and triage. And so those must return mailers were put on the back burner and we thought we will do those later. Um, next slide, please. Um, another, a few things about the way Indiana does eligibility. We've always had integrated eligibility. If you tell us something about your SNAP or TANF case, Medicaid takes that information and says, thank you, we'll act on that as well. Um, and we do that at any time of the year when we learn new information about someone. So whenever someone is coming due for Medicaid redetermination, we do ping for Medicaid, the Verify Current Income Service. So we look to see, do we have any new electronic verifications on your income? Do we need to figure out anything that's not reasonably compatible before we put you in your bucket for redetermination? And starting in December, 2020, we implemented our asset verification system. So we're now able to also do this for our age-blind disabled population, uh, those who have an asset test. We now ping the AVS uh, well in advance of their redetermination process to see is there anything questionable that we need to figure out or can we put you in the ex parte renewal bucket or in the need not return mailer bucket where you just have to tell us if you have any changes. Next slide, please. So what we found is in the two months before the public health emergency, we had about 7% of our members who were in that third bucket, meaning you need to do something or you might get closed. Um, and the other 93% qualified for auto renewal, either ex parte or they got it, they only had to tell us if there were any changes. For the most recent two months, we're showing 18% who are going into the must return mailer bucket. And as the, we've been pushing them by two months each time they come due. So that bucket is growing and growing and growing. And now that we know, you know, as Craig referenced, that it is likely that the PHE will last for the rest of 2021. We're now looking again, is this really the best thing that we can do with our time, our limited bandwidth of workers and system time? Um, because within six months of the end of the PHE, we're going to have to work through this backlog of postponed work. So, you know, we have all of the redeterminations that will be due. We have individuals that maybe we know based on what information we have now are not going to be eligible when all of this is over. But once we start those terminations, then what picks up again is the churn. So we have people who are eligible, but they forgot to turn in a piece of paper and they'll reapply. We have lots of appeals that we'll get. So the more we wait, now that we know we have a little bit more time to think through these, the longer we wait to do some of this work, the more we're going to have just a huge amount of work that needs to be done in six months after the PHE ends. Next slide, please. So we are looking at, um, do we really want to keep holding off on those must return mailers? And you know we're getting to the place where we're thinking we do not because it's going to be unmanageable when all of this is said and done. So we're looking at ways to go ahead and send those mailers out and let individuals um, return or not return their information. We will not take any negative actions on them uh, until the end of the PHE based on the guidance that we've been given. And then after the PHE ends, we're going to send notices to end any individuals who currently are failing or need to verify some piece of information. In that guidance that CMS gave us, they said, if you're telling individuals that um, hey, we would have closed you except for the PHE, uh, and you do that within six months of the end of the PHE, you don't have to send two notices. I think every state scrambled so quickly to try and get system support in place that we're all doing things a little differently. That was not part of what Indiana did as our plan. We have not told people we're only keeping you open because of the public health emergency. So we will have to send two notices. We're planning on doing one about six weeks before any closure that says, here's what we know about you. You might have to verify some of these things and make sure we know all the stuff that we need to keep you eligible if you are. Um, and then if there's no response, we will send another one about two weeks before the actual closure. Again, they have time until that effective date to verify anything that's missing. And we're hoping that we can really work on the, making the communication clear so that those who truly are eligible, uh, we don't disenroll them for failure to turn in a piece of paper. And I think that may be my last slide. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, Josh, policy. Yes, hi, uh, my name is Josh Schultz. I'm a senior policy analyst with Softbeam. 
um, before joining Softion, I've held roles with consulting firms and um, uh, Medicare and Medicaid focused nonprofit, helping people uh, access health insurance coverage um, in New York City. Um, today, well, we're going to talk about the policy issues that affect, um, that will affect the reassessments. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about the state health official letter that both Craig and Nanas have referenced and talk a little bit about um, uh, history of Medicaid reassessments in two states and then talk about um, some legislation in um, a few states that um, impacts verification and reassessment. So as Craig mentioned in, in Nanas, um, in December, CMS sent a, uh, a letter to state health officials expecting them to begin returning to normal Medicaid operations. Um, but many states face challenges, including large volumes of outstanding out eligibility and enrollment actions. Um, any state that is receiving the temporary FMAP increase, which is every state, can't terminate Medicaid coverage for people who are no longer eligible until the end of the month in which the PHE ends, the public health emergency ends. Um, for areas that states are expected to focus eligibility and, and enrollment actions once the, um, once the PHE ends, includes processing applications received during the PHE, completing verifications for self-attested individuals, acting on changes in circumstances, and completing reassessments, which is important for this presentation. States furthermore are expected to adopt a risk-based approach to pending eligibility and enrollment actions that prioritizes case actions for individuals who are most likely to no longer be eligible for coverage. We're looking back um, at past reassessment efforts. Um, we look to the state of Illinois. In May 2012, the state of Illinois enacted the Save Medicaid Access and Resources Together, or SMART Act, creating an enhanced eligibility verification initiative called the Illinois Medicaid Redetermination Project, or IMRP. Um, under the IMRP, a third-party vendor reviewed Medicaid cases and made a recommendation for whether benefits should be continued, canceled, or changed. Um, under the IMRP, Medicaid cases were flagged for review if they had high unreported income and resources, a primary residency in another state, or benefits received from another state. And under this reassessment initiative, as of November 2014, so a year and a half later, the state had removed 234,000 individuals from the Medicaid caseload. Similarly, in Pennsylvania, um, Act 22 um, called on the Department of Public Welfare to establish a uniform procedure to identify, investigate, and resolve potential cases of fraud, misrepresentation, or inadequate documentation for Medicaid and welfare programs. Um, within 18 months, 220,000 people were removed from welfare rolls, saving the state $710 million. Going forward to today, at least four state legislatures are considering bills to mandate additional eligibility checks for Medicaid and other public health assistance programs and public assistance programs. Those states are Iowa, Ohio, Utah, and Montana. Most of the bills require more frequent eligibility checks and new asset tax to checks for certain beneficiaries, including one of the bills in Ohio directly addresses the upcoming Medicaid reassessment process. In Iowa, SF 389 was passed by the Iowa Senate in February and has been referred to an Iowa House subcommittee. This legislation requires the Department of Human Services, State Department of Human Services, to implement an eligibility verification system for public assistance programs, and it would create an asset test for SNAP. It's estimated based on a budgetary note that 1% of all enrollees uh, would lose their benefits under the legislation based on these checks. Here's um, a snapshot of the legislative text, which we have for all of these in case anyone's interested. In Montana, SB 100 passed the Montana Senate in February and was most recently considered um, by the House Committee on Human Services in April. This legislation would require the State Department of Public Health and Human Services 
to create a computerized system to verify eligibility and assess income and assets in SNAP, TANF, CHIP, and Medicaid cases that are based on MAGI, Modified Adjustments for Gross Income. Perhaps most importantly for this presentation, in Ohio, SB 17 um, would require within 60 days of the continuous coverage requirement, the maintenance of effort requirement that Craig was mentioned, um, it would require the state to complete eligibility redeterminations for all Medicaid recipients who hadn't been determined in the past year. And furthermore, it would request CMS approval to redetermine eligibility for all Medicaid enrollees who had been receiving benefits for three or more months during the PHE. The legislation also requires the Medicaid director to enter into data matching agreements with the Lottery Commission, the Casino Control Commission, the Department, the, the Director of Health, and the Director of Job and Family Services. Finally, in Utah, HB 344 was introduced in the Utah House, but it hasn't received a vote in either chamber. That legislation allows the Department of Health to contract with a third party vendor to assist with verifying Medicaid eligibility. A budgetary note predicts that 900 Medicaid enrollees will lose coverage under the legislation. So at Soft the Un, we're continuing to monitor these pieces of legislation closely. We've also been in touch with our contacts at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities who have some concerns about the legislation. Um, I'd encourage you to reach out to me by email at jschultz at softbeyond.com. Set up a time to learn more about these pieces of legislation. Um, we're tracking it closely and you know, what happens here um, could become more popular in other states. And um, with that, I thank you for your time. Okay, great. Thanks, Josh. Uh, I will uh, do a quick wrap up uh, and then we'll move to question and answer. Uh, first of all, Softion supports CMS and their Office of Program Integrity and the use of technology to assist in asset and income verifications to allow for timely and accurate eligibility determinations by the state. So I'd like to just review very quickly our technology uh, that we're, we're putting in place and, and a new offering. So currently Softion has, uh, after a, a year of, of a pilot, we're, we're currently operating in ABS in four states uh, we've accomplished in the past three years. Our, uh, the AVS is very different in that it shares data across agencies. So SNAP, TANF, as well as Medicaid and the other programs have the ability to share whether or not your IES can do that. Um, a, a new win for us is we just recently in one state accomplished a income verification award uh, where we displaced the current uh, vendor that's uh, in many states across the country utilizing ADP data as, as is expected. And then finally, I have two slides. I just wanna talk very quickly about an external Medicaid assessment uh, program and then our use of risk scoring. So this is it. Um, uh, in, in, at Softfield, we understand uh, the issues that are upcoming, the clog that Nana spoke to and the challenges of really trying to put together a reassessment service. So we've, we've uh, accomplished this through what we call as an external reassessment service. So in this case, you know, no, no need to uh, utilize your system integrator or do some expensive change requests. Uh, it's really just a two-step process where you'll provide uh, your, your uh, Medicaid uh, enrollees to us. Uh, we just need a name, a social security, and an address. And the only reason we need an address is so that we can check uh, financial assets in a 65-mile radius around that address. And then in, over, in an overnight batch, just as we're doing in one of our states now, uh, monthly where we do 25 to almost 50,000 in an overnight batch uh, every month, uh, we receive a, a, a detailed risk score analysis uh, of, those, uh, of the population. And then Josh, the last slide, this is uh, the, the benefits of the external process is that it does provide for uh, very efficient eligibility determinations uh, the re return data is very robust. We're going to check eligibility, make sure there isn't a fraudulent Social Security, and then the normal financial institution, real property, and motor vehicle. What's easy to help prioritize work is we do a risk score that's color-coded, red for high risk, uh, yellow for medium, and green for low. And those are based off of business rules established within the Medicaid program. So we'll risk score those back. 
so that they become actionable. And then uh, finally, instead of changing your system or trying to get an input from your uh, system integrator, uh, it's very conveniently set up and priced for a nightly batch. So that's the new Sofion reassessment service. So with that, Josh, we'll go to the last slide and we can begin our Q&A. Okay. So the first question is what impact, and I'll give this to, um, I'll give this to, to um, Nanas. Uh, what impact will CMS's unwinding process guidance have on how states should approach technology, data, workflow, and what should they be thinking about? Yeah, I think it's going to be, you know, different in every state. Every state does things a little differently. And like I mentioned in, during my time, um, we all did our best to get something in place to comply with this as soon as possible. And some of us were able to do things that were very automated. And some of us have had to work off of spreadsheets and lists and overtime for workers doing things and closing people, but then going back and opening them back up just as soon as we possibly could. Um, so I think it, it'll be different for every state. Um, it is kind of nice to have the you know, good news, bad news, but knowing that this is likely to last through the end of the year gives us a much better way to plan how to um, space out some of this work. Uh, the one thing that I, I think that that document was very comprehensive, very helpful. The only thing that I would add is it, it does give some um, runway for applications received during the PHE, but I think once we start closing people, we're going to have brand new uh, applications that are going to be a very high volume um, because the churn will begin again. So my, my suggestion would be to start now, think about what would be the best way to do this, get some of your really smart systems people in the conversation to help with you um, and, and make a plan that's gonna really work for your state and the level of automation that you're able to do. That's great, thank you. Um, this one I'll give to Mike Sasko. Um, how does Softion's external service interface with the state's enterprise data architecture? Yeah, well, it's designed to, to really not integrate, actually. The, 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 kind of the, the benefit or the efficiency comes through basically an external um, you know, batch file, and then the data is returned uh, in like to the state. Uh, it can be integrated in. All of our ABS systems are integrated. Uh, and, and it can be established in, into whatever kind of workflow is appropriate. But the real benefit is the idea of having this external review that can be done in a nightly batch where the data comes back prioritized and you can work on those red ones, right? The, the high risk scores and maybe uh, potentially set those aside now for like, like Nana said, for, for maybe potential action or, or uh, you know, additional information later. That's great. Um, so, um, Craig, uh, what are so, what are MCOs doing to prepare for the reassessments? Again, those last questions were very detailed. I'm glad they went to Nanas and Mike. Ooh, um, good, good answers. But uh, what are they doing? Well, they're, they're, we are partners with the states, right? Let's just be honest with this. We are we are the we're the tip of the spear with the with the states. So, and as Nanas pointed out, every state is very different in with how they're perceiving this clog, which was the word, see, I'm stealing your word there, no, it's, um, and every state is looking at it differently, and every state has different activities within their state that some have 12-month verification, some have self-attestation, some of them have different mechanisms by which they determine eligibility, which is, as Mike's point, was state-specific on these sorts of activities and state-specific contracts, so, but we work, we work directly with the states, right, so we are hand-in-glove partners with the states in all of these activities, not the determination person of the determination, but getting some of that information about those um, folks, understanding what's happening in their lives, right? Uh, because we are, we are in direct contact with them, right? The whole point of MCOs is to be in direct contact with, you don't just wait for a claim to come in, 
that managed care organization's job is to be engaging the population that we serve and cover in an active manner. And so it's not, we are not, we're not meant to be waiting, sitting on our sidelines, waiting for something to come in. We have outreach workers, we have folks, and we've been doing this all the way through the, the this COVID pandemic is, and with different populations, as I pointed out, how do we engage these folks? How do you get through all this stuff? And I'll tell you, when we get to this redetermination, we're going to be right there with the, with the covered folks and with the states as we get through this. So both. That's great, thank you. Um, Nanas, I have a question for you. Uh, what are the budget implications for this year and next from the fog? Oh, well, I, I, I am not a budget expert, but it definitely has an impact. Um, you know, while we're getting the enhanced FMAP, that, that will end before we will have all of our excess enrollment um, taken care of. You know, we are not looking to quickly disenroll everyone, but we do want to get, you know, to use a, a term that maybe wasn't viewed so positively a while ago, but it fits here. We need to right size our Medicaid program. If you are truly eligible, we, we want you to stay on. Um, but if you are not, then we're happy. We could help you a little during the pandemic. And now we wish you well, and we want to help you find uh, the proper place for you to get your coverage. Um, so it definitely has budgetary impacts and it is a little, it's been a little difficult to measure that because some of the, um, you know, we thought unemployment's going to go up and applications are going to go up and that didn't happen. So I think there are a lot of, this is new for all of us and we are still kind of feeling our way, trying to make the best projections we can. Um, and I wish I had a better answer than that, but that's probably the best that I can uh do right now at this point. It's, it's definitely a concern. It will have a huge impact because that additional FMAP is going to end while we still have a lot of our extra people still on. That's great. Thank you. You're, uh, you're popular today, not as somebody else has asked for you. Um, did the agency leadership demand this approach for more frequent reassessments? How has that impacted policy going forward? So I think that's talking about our, our traditional um, where we have, all, I, I think it's just always been the way that we've done it. Um, Indiana has had some really great, uh, really smart and hardworking people that we've partnered with on our technology. Um, and we have, um, you know, hooked up with our division of workforce development, uh, the new hire alerts. Uh, once the work number came on using the verify current income, we um, have always had a lot of those in place and utilized those um, and then getting our ABS in December of 2020. So it's not something that it's kind of been a, an ethos in Indiana that has been there for you know a decade or more. Um, we've just always had our SNAP, TANF and Medicaid together. And so all of the things that we need to know for one program are also known for the other programs. Um, and one thing that I would add, I think it was, uh, I can't remember which, which question it was, probably one that went to Mike, but something that we look at is because we have so many people who, you know, they, got, they have varying levels of life skills and a lot of them do get kicked off of the program for not turning something in. So the more we can utilize electronic verifications, it not, it's not just a punitive thing. We're helping individuals, you know, if we can find that information for them and help them to stay eligible, and that's what we want to do. Great. Well, one more question for you, Nanas. Um, how does the how does this um, impact the future the future um, of Ohio and its its budget process? Um, well, Ohio, that may be one of your policy questions. I don't know if that's necessarily for me. Yeah, you know. I'm sorry, I, I got a, a little confused there. Um, I don't have any other questions. Yeah, I think the question is what's what's the likelihood of Ohio to pass and what's the future implications for that? Oh, oh okay. Um, it's, it's looking, um, you know, I'm not sure about the likelihood of passage. It's it's um, 
it's looking um, like it could pass the uh, in the Senate. Um, but I don't know about the, um, the likelihood of passing overall. Um, if it did, it would have implications for other states, I think. Uh, a few of and these, a few of these, uh, I'm sorry, Craig, did you say something? I'm not gonna speculate on Ohio, but I just wanna go back to a couple other comments on this one. But, and can I ask questions too? Is that the way it works? I know that's a terrible sure. thing to say, but, uh, but on the interest, I think a lot of folks here are interested, obviously we're Medicaid folks, right? We're obviously Medicaid people. Um, but Safian does more than that, right? You guys also have exchange marketplace activities. And so you can help people, you can help a whole number of places as these things are occurring in different spaces as well, right? You have, I think you even have Medicare and some other places too. I don't know enough about the outside of Medicaid. So I'm blindly asking this question, but you guys do more than just the Medicaid space. Back to my original argument, which is even if you're off of Medicaid, finding an insurance home for you is incredibly important. And I just wanted to throw yeah. it out there for you guys to say, is there, there, there are other, there's, there's beyond Medicaid in your guys' space, even though there isn't in mine, right? Right, and correct. And, and part of the, the SHO, the state health officials letter, did speak to the transition. And yeah, that is something for those individuals that are earmarked, um, there is the, the opportunity through an integrated eligibility to get you to uh, an ACA plan. And, and through the ARP uh, process, that's become much more generous. So many of these folks will qualify for a zero copay uh, premium, excuse me, zero premium plan. Uh, the idea is, is to let's not lose anyone. Um, let's ensure that we allow for that smooth transition to happen. And, and it is, uh, if, if you followed some of the recent legislation, that, that is a very generous uh, um, uh, packaging out through ARP. So yeah, it is important. And that's part of the, sh the show letter is to allow states to, uh, to execute that transition. That's great. Yeah, because a lot of the conversation will be, and to your point, Josh, about Ohio, and I'm not, again, not speculating on Ohio, is you're going to have to start doing a math question on 6.2 on an FMAP bump versus how many folks that you're covering and is the PHE over and is the MOE still there? This starts to become a math equation for some of these states. But if you really have a transition, a smooth transition, so you're not just moving people that need insurance out of Medicaid and you know find their own way. And those plans, as Mike pointed out, the, the increased uh, subsidies within the ACA plans um, are 100% federal. Right. So for you in the state level, it's 100 percent federal. You keep them on insurance at, at silver plan. It's a silver plan. Right, Mike, if I'm not mistaken, um, the subsidy levels for those. Yes, they're, so, they're decent plans. Yes, they are, they are the so, silver plan. So you're not handing off to a bronze and, and they should see a very similar coverage uh, that, that they had previous. So or unaffordable. Yeah, it's not unaffordable for folks in the lower levels. And so um, we Medicaid health plans will always say we want you we want the best insurance possible, most flexible, sustainable insurance we can find within Medicaid. But we're really interested in just people having co good comprehensive insurance. Um, and so, you know, recognizing all those, this conversation is about redeterminations, but it's not about people losing insurance. You have to find a way and help them through these challenges. We're not talking about bazillionaires here. We're talking about the people that are, you know, Boy, I made it to 151 of poverty, and what did I just lose? So yeah, so um, or 102 percent of poverty, and what just happened? Um, my life is now upside down even further. So I think there's there's some real conversations to be had across the spectrum. So that's Great. A thank you, Craig. Point. I think that's an important point of, of of continuity of care. I think that's 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 real significant. Okay, Josh, I don't see any other questions on my side. Do you have any over you? No, I don't. I was just going to add that, um, you know, with Craig's point, um, you know, one of the things that I do is I monitor what's happening at the state um, exchanges and the state exchange board meetings. And at every single one of those meetings recently, people have um, brought up the large number of folks who are going to be coming to the exchange from Medicaid, um, a large, large portion of people coming to the exchange from Medicaid um, in each of these states. So... That's a very, very valid point. Okay. Um, well, I, don't, thank, I don't have any. any okay, good. I'll go ahead and wrap. I want to thank, thank everyone for, for your attention today. Um, I, if you would like to contact Greg or Nanas or Josh or myself, uh, we, we are certainly available. You can contact us 
through the HITC, I believe through Rob Waters. Um, and our, our slide deck is obviously will be posted and this presentation will be recorded. So uh, thank you, Craig, Nanas, Josh, uh, and I appreciate uh, your attention. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.